I am live on Instagram. Woohoo! Hi, Instagram. How you doing? Oh, 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 we're live on Facebook too. Oh, Mercury must be out of retrograde or whatever. What is it when it's not retrograde? Is it foregrade? I don't know. Oh, Nomad Rose is first in the party. Arr, arr, arr. Good going. Um, hi, everybody. Hi, te tears for Sasha. Teals for Sasha? I don't know. Um, comments in moderation. Okay, we've got Katie's here and uh, Kay Nilsson and Marbuska. I love these Instagram. Oh, here's Crystal from Western Massachusetts and Jill Tucker and, uh, oh, I don't know how to pronounce that. Tracy's here and Charm D and Wendy. Yay, Kim. Yay, I'm Kareen. We're all here together again. What a happy time. Let's see. Instagram is Suzanne Spar. Suzanne Sparrow, I think that is. Ah. Radiant Bettina says hello. Stephanie's here and Charlie and Dr. Donna came along and Dee Dee's in Austin, Texas and then Sharon's in Nova Scotia and Cheryl's from Atlanta and you're all coming from everywhere and it is magnificent. Okay, we have enough people. Let's just get started. Woo! <laughs> all right. I can't believe y'all showed up when I didn't post the topic or anything until like 10 minutes ago. But I had... I had an inspired night and I wanted to tell you about it. I wish I could see your faces because I would, and, and your bodies, because I'd have you raise your hands to, to say whether this has happened to you. Um, you could always put it in the chat, but that's, yeah, it's kind of hard for me to read at the same time I'm doing everything else. But I had a dream, a literal dream that was like the very first time I ever did the gathering room from like uh, from my ranch in California, there were like three people there. Um, I talked about this dream that I have quite often and I wanted to know if anybody else has it. And the dream is that I'm just going through my house. Sometimes it's the house I have now. Sometimes it's a house that I lived in a while ago, but I, in, the, in the dream I live there. And I've been going up and down a hallway past this little door for a long time. And I, one day I just kind of go, oh, what's that door? Hmm. And in the dream, I opened the door of my house and there's a whole space on the other side of the door. And for me, it, it's huge. It's always huge. Uh, sometimes it has like beautiful rooms with tables and things, but it always has a cathedral, a big ass cathedral in my house that I didn't know about. And I go wandering around thinking, oh my God, like I am very wealthy. Like I, I live in a palace with cathedral but it's just it's really it's a pleasing dream but it also kind of gobsmacks me it's like huh, huh. now i have talked to many other people who have had a dream like this or very close to it and i actually think i mean i went so far as to actually look it up online now usually i use my own form of dream analysis which is to become you pretend that you are whatever's in the dream so i become the my house in the dream and you kind of do a little play acting where you say okay now I'm going to pretend to be a house I'm a house and you start to describe yourself I'm Martha's house in the dream and I am deceptively uninteresting I am ordinary looking I am hiding things that are very fun and then I then I'd say well what's the message that the the dream symbol has for the dreamer. So oh, I am Martha's house and what I'm here to tell Martha is, there's always something they're here to tell you. Um, keep opening doors. You're going to find stuff. So I, I um, it actually says the same thing when you look it up online. So the, the house usually represents your life and the rooms in the house are the different facets of your life and the hidden part of the house that you're just looking at is something that hasn't been conscious for you, but it's there. It's already there. And I've asked several people today if they've ha ever had that dream. And they say, yes, I, they all said, yes, they had. And I asked them, is it a good dream or a bad dream? They almost all said it was good. So I was quite struck by this dream this morning when I woke up. I was like, that there is such a feeling of possibility and excitement and adventure and curiosity that comes with the dream. And I thought, I 
this time, I've had this dream a lot. I want to do something about it. I actually want to find that door and open it. So I believe that there is a, we've been walking around our lives, walking past inconspicuous hidden doors all over the place. There's a Sufi parable about a man who's sitting on a, he's a beggar and he's sitting on this old nasty box and a wise enlightened person comes by and the guy says, could you please spare some money? And the, the wise person says, well, I don't have any money, but what, check out that box you're sitting on. What's in the box? And the beggar says, this has just always been here. I've just been sitting on it forever. And the wise guy says, the wise man says, okay, no, but look inside it. So finally the guy gets off his box where he's been sitting for 10 years or whatever. And he opens the lid and it's full of gold and diamonds and precious treasures. And this is used as a, a metaphor for enlightenment in several spiritual traditions that there's something ordinary looking that we're taking for granted that we're already using that contains enlightenment, that holds enlightenment. So I was thinking about the, the show Westworld, which was on, I can't remember which channel um, streamed it, but it's, a, it's an event series. It's one of those like Netflix series and it's about this this simulated world where a lot of robots that are that look exactly like humans and even think like humans mostly act out this life in the old west uh, the american west and the robots sometimes this is in a futuristic world so it's weird because they're like 19th century pioneers only they're actually existing in some super science future so sometimes the people who come in, so people come in and interact with these people. It's, it's an amusement park, basically. And the robots are very human-like, except they're programmed so that, like if somebody brings a photograph of the super technical world outside their, their enclosure and drops it and they find it, they look at it and instead of saying, oh my God, this is, what are all these machines and bright lights and big cities and whatever, they just, look at it and say, oh, that doesn't look like anything to me. So anything that could give them a clue that there's a bigger world outside, they're programmed so it doesn't look like anything to them. So here we sit on these boxes thinking, well, my life's pretty ordinary. My house is ordinary. My insides are ordinary. And the whole time there are things that don't look like anything to us, but they are hiding our enlightenment, our, a, a completely expanded way of being. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So my theory is that um, the reason we don't already understand enlightenment is not that we don't contain it. I think it's who we are, but it's that our bodies and psychology is focused on what we see as important, which is stuff. Um, there's this beautiful line in the Tao Te Ching, you may have heard me quote before, it goes, we join spokes to make a wheel, but it is the center hole that allows the wheel to turn. We um, form clay to make a pot, but it is the space inside that holds what we need. We hammer wood to make a house, but the blank space in between the walls is where we live. We work with being, but non-being is what we use. So I remember being really struck by this. I, I quote it a lot because it felt really true for me when I read it. And then I tried to figure out what felt true and it, it all fell apart. I was just like, I don't even know what I'm talking about. What I think now is that we are geared to notice physical stuff and experiences that come to us through our senses but all the time, our way of existing, our way of being is already enlightened. And whatever we see as the objects in our lives keep us from noticing what, we, what doesn't look like anything to us, which is the empty spaces between the things. So the empty space in the house, the empty space between your thoughts, the empty space between falling deeply asleep and waking up. These are the things we see as empty. But in fact, they may not be. I'm sure you've seen this little optical illusion. It's called a Rubin vase. Mm -mm -mm. 
So there you go. I did it. I printed out two versions, one where the the space between the two faces here is black and one where the space between is white. And the point of this, when I used to teach art at Harvard, the professor I worked with said that whenever you draw two things, you're actually drawing three things. The two things, you draw two faces, and the third thing is the, va the vase, the space between them. And whenever you draw two things, if you forget to think about the space between them, and Will Ryman, this brilliant professor, he, he always called it the interstitial space, the space between the stuff. If you don't know that that's also a thing, you will make drawings that read badly. Like you have to understand that when you draw two things, you are drawing three things. The space between is as important as the objects you draw. We work with being, but the non-being can create a completely different reality that you don't see unless you turn your attention to what you thought was just the space between. So we're going through life. We're having thoughts, we're having experiences. And there are spaces between the experiences and they're hidden, not because um, we can't see them. They're actually right in plain sight. They're hidden because our attention never goes to them. I, um, there was once a, well, there are many, many traditions in the ancient American continent, right up to the European settlers came and wiped everything out in the last few hundred years where a lot of the, the cultures had a tradition of training scouts or trackers. They called them different things in different nations of Native Americans. But um, you may have seen pictures of Crazy Horse, who was, I, I believe, a Cheyenne scout. And he, he was always wearing a red scarf, bright red scarf. That was because he was a scout. And to become a scout in his... Uh, in his tribe, somebody's going to write and correct me. I probably have the Cheyenne thing wrong. Um, I just thought it up. But in that tradition, you had to be able to become so inconspicuous that you could walk up to a wolf in broad daylight, touch it, and then leave without it ever noticing you. Wolves are incredibly intelligent and have very sharp senses. So I was working with a, a brilliant master coach named Michael Trotta once and he was teaching he apprenticed with the Odala Indians and became a fire maker in their tradition and he also had studied the art of the scout and he he basically knew how to become invisible and it's not that you could see through him it's that he knew how to occupy he knew where human attention goes and how to slip into the spaces between where people are paying attention. So there are, the, there are spaces in a landscape that we look at. We look from tree to tree, to, from rock to rock. But then there are these, these spaces that we don't, they don't look like anything to us. And you can, if you put yourself in one of those spaces, people will not see you. And I thought, nah, that can't be true. And we were doing this um, seminar with, with 12 women from around the US and a few other countries. And Michael would take us out and try to teach us how to be invisible. And it was hysterical because there's you know, all these women wandering around Sedona, Arizona. And what you're supposed to do is hear other people coming and then blend into the foliage so that they never see you. Well, we didn't know how to do that. So the first thing we would see were other hikers coming toward us. And we would freak out and then run into the bushes trying to be invisible. And the hikers would follow us into the bushes going, what's happening? What are we doing? <laughs> we weren't invisible. And then by the end of the seminar, we had to, we were going to make a fire and we were going to go to this in order to do this without setting everything ablaze. We had to go to a special place that was just a grassy field where there was a lot of water around and where we could set a fire legally and contain it. So Michael and I showed up um, to the space and we were waiting for these women and we waited for like, they were 10 minutes late. They were 15 minutes late. They were 20 minutes late. And we were like, what is happening? What, why are they all absent? At which point they all appeared. They just stepped up from wherever they'd been hiding. They'd been lying in very shallow depressions in the grass. They'd been sitting in bushes. Like we all, I mean, they did it. They figured out how to be invisible. 
and we did not see them until they suddenly stepped forward. I had another experience of doing that with, with also with Michael, where he was working with a bunch of people and I had hurt my eye. And so I just went and sat on a rock and waited for them to come back. And I waited and waited and waited. And then suddenly they were just all there. They'd all been standing in spaces that my attention had missed. So we know from, from psychological studies that most of what we think we're seeing everything around us, but our attention only goes to certain things. And most of what we could perceive in any given scenario, we never notice. It's called attentional blindness. And I believe that there are these moments. So think about, I'm writing this book on creativity and I've been asking a lot of people this question. I want to think, you guys to think about this. Think about a time when you were puzzling about a subject that was really important to you, where you were trying to create something or come up with an answer. So it could be a mathematical equation or it could be that you're throwing a pot or it could be that you're, you know, you're trying to figure out what would make a better recipe for some food you love or you're trying to figure out uh, how to express something like love in a poem or whatever, but you're pushing at the edges of your creativity. You're pushing forward. In that moment, you, you cease to feel like you are even there. This is, it's, you go attention blind to everything except what you're creating. So I've been asking people about this. And my question is, can you be anxious at the same time you're in this creative space? And so far the answer has been no. Um, people can be anxious before and after, but in the moment of being creative, they're, they're not anxious, but they always say, oh, it went by in a flash. I didn't even, I don't even remember doing it. So, and this can last for hours. You can be in a creative state like that for hours and time will go like that. And that's why people on the great British baking show and the pottery throwdown, I keep talking about, they sit down, they say, you have six hours to make this thing. And six hours later, they look up and the people are like, no, we've only had 10 minutes. And it's because they're in that space. So here's the weird thing, you guys. When you're going in and out of attention, when you're going in and out of sleep, you pass the places that open onto your enlightenment, but you just don't really notice them. And there is, I wanted to teach you, I'm getting, I'm going on too long, but there is a, an exercise that was stumbled upon by some brain researchers at Princeton that for some reason made the brain go into a state of clarity and um, a, a lack of suffering. Like it, it's not that it's extremely manic or anything. It's just an absolute clarity and lack of suffering. And it's really, it's a simple question. And I'm gonna put it to you. And that is, I may have asked you this before. Is it possible for you to imagine the space inside the atoms between your eyes? So most of every atom is full of empty space. So you've got matter between your eyes, but it's also full of emptiness. So just ask yourself that question. Is it possible for me to imagine the space in the distance between my eyes? What this does is it turns your attention to the nothing, to the hidden door. And they found that people who can sustain the type of focus that that question brings up feel less pain, are able to come up with brilliant answers to problems, um, have better relationships. There's something about focusing on the empty space inside you that clicks you in to what was already there. You've already been sitting on a box of treasure. How do you open it? You open it by looking where you've never looked before, where you've never thought to look, where it doesn't look like anything to you. Like that space that went by in a flash while you were making burritos. <laughs> like you can, your enlightenment is showing up in all these little inconspicuous places. And as you start to notice them, that's what meditation does. You sit there and the, the day you've been experiencing goes past in your mind and you try not to think and it comes back and you try not to think. And then suddenly you realize, oh, in the space of non-thought, there's been a part of you that wasn't thinking all along, that has consistently been present, that is not afraid of anything and does not identify as you. It identifies as love, consciousness, space, the universe, but you don't actually notice it because it doesn't feel like yourself. It doesn't feel like your ego. 
it feels like light, enlightenment. It feels like no thing. We work with being, but non-being is what we use. So this is a very abstract sort of a little lecturette that I've just given, and I'm really interested to see what people's questions are. So let's go to those. So Melanie Phoenix, uh, oh, first, uh, yeah. Oh, Melanie Phoenix says it's Michael Troyold's birthday today. How cool, that's so awesome. Happy birthday, Michael. Linda says, do you think that it's anxiety that impels people to try to fill up the spaces between? Yeah, for sure. well, it's not that we're trying to fill up the spaces in between, is that we're trying to hang on with the way we usually think. The way we usually think is what's hiding our enlightenment. It's right there in plain sight, but the way we think makes it invisible. And that's such a hard concept to get across. But anxiety says never let go, never let go, never let go. That's why you can't sleep when you're anxious. And as you go into sleep, you go through a hypnagogic state. And when you come out, you go through another one. And in that state, people often experience mystical, you know, visions, um, psychic flashes. And that certainly happens to me as I'm sliding into sleep. I, get, I start getting all kinds of ping, 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 ping of people who are thinking about me and um, solutions to ideas and sometimes a sense of incredible love enveloping me. Yeah, anxiety is what's hanging on. And it's in the spaces where there is no anxiety at all that we feel the enlightenment that is already what and who we are. We, then we, we're running our fingers through the golden jewels at that moment. But we believe that anxiety is part of us. It's not. It's part of the function of the material we live in, the matter that is us. And when we can allow that into the background, like allow that to fade back, and then the, the, the space in between becomes the object we're looking at. <laughs> so, uh... Yes, Melanie says, please talk about how writing is the space between word, art, rather than drawing. Would this be what showed uh, tell means, showing between the spaces? In a way, here's what I actually think. I think that words are like little trains and they carry cargo and the cargo is energy. So sometimes I'll read a book like, Eat, Pray, Love, okay, 13 million copies mm. sold. It's this memoir that Liz wrote. There have been hundreds, thousands of memoirs written since Eat, Pray, Love that where people tried to get into sort of the memoir. I wrote a couple of memoirs myself, but 99.999% of them have very similar styles, words, even stories, but the energy is different. The words, carry energy. Those little lines of ink on paper carry a meaning to our minds, but the energy they bring with them is felt by the heart and by the soul, by the consciousness. I don't know what it is, but two people can write something that's almost identical and one will be absolutely full of light and the other one will just be flat beer. And I don't even know how to explain it. I just know that you have to write from a place of illumination to put the right energy in. And let me tell you what that feels like to Liz. She was just at the house yesterday. It feels like she says the room falls away and time goes away. And it's also that she as a human mm. being goes away. There is nothing but the words putting themselves out on the page and the energy of the project she's working on. And she's, she's kind of in an altered state when she does that in a very positive way. But to do that with words means that you have to go back and forth really quickly between the right and left hemispheres of the brain. And it, it, it means intense focus. And she was talking about when she's writing, she's writing this amazing book called The Snow Forest. Oh my gosh, you guys are going to love it. Um, but when she's writing that hard, she has to sleep a lot. And it's because she's making new connections in her brain, looking at the things she's never looked at before, and then bringing that energy to the page it's like some kind of a magical sleight of hand. You write a series of words, but it's the feeling. We hammer wood to make a house, but it's the space inside that we use. We write words on a page or on a computer screen to carry information, but it's the space between the words. It's the space inside the words that carries the energy that is the real thing we're communicating. 
It's just, it's magic. It's magic. Um, Val Tuber Music says, you guys with your cool Instagram names, you're too cool for me. But Val Tuber Musicus, I think, says, losing yourself in flow is different from losing yourself in distractions like TV. Yeah, completely. Because when you're watching the TV, um, you are very much sitting on the little box. You're looking at a little box and you're entertaining yourself with lights and sounds and, you know, people yelling and things that are very much the stuff of human existence. Now, that is not to say that you won't watch something on TV that is full of enlightenment, full of spirit. I mean, that the first couple of episodes of Westworld were very much, uh, maybe they still are, a metaphor for us living in the state that we're living in and not realizing that there's a whole universe outside ourselves. So there are very, very powerful spiritual lessons. There are there are those hidden doors in TV as much as in anything. It's a different feeling though. Instead of saying, oh, that was really exciting and the gun ch battle and the car chase and everything. Instead, it's like, I've got to see that again. Like, I don't even really know why. I just really want to see it again. And it stays with me and it moves me and I can't stop thinking about it. That's when the energy is trying to get your attention. It's all about attention. Everything is there for us. It's just that our attention tends to go to being and non-being is what we're after all the time. And we can't even talk about that. It doesn't even make sense in language because it's outside of language. So Anne says, how can we train ourselves to notice more of these spaces? The biggest thing that we can do, and believe me, I've been doing a lot of research lately, you have to bore yourself. <laughs> I bore myself. By that I mean you have to sit calmly with nothing happening, which we consider boring and horrible. I mean, my goodness, I feel the constant pressure to fill my mind with stuff all the time. I, there's so many wonderful books to read. There's so many interesting shows on TV. There are so many, like even at night, I'm like listening to like sleep hypnosis meditations that are supposed to like make you healthier. And you're, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna plug those in. Even when I'm sleeping, I'm taking in media. Thank God that I meditate because it's the one time when I'm like, oh yeah, that's actually not what it's about. That's all gonna go down. Oh, the sun will die someday. It's all going down, but no, but space never will. The no, the no thingness never will. And by the way, it's not a coincidence that ninety five percent of the universe is missing. It's made of something we don't understand. It's not made of atoms. It's we can't perceive it in any way. But it we know from the gravitational movement of planets and constellations and galaxies that. It's exerting gravitational force all the time. It's just not made of atoms. They call it dark matter and dark energy. And we just frankly do not know what it is. We just know that it exists. It doesn't look like anything to us. So <clears throat> when you sit and allow yourself to pay attention to no thing, I had an experience when I was finishing writing The Miracle, The Way of Integrity. And I was reading Dante over and over and over in different versions. And I believe he had this enlightenment experience. And I was meditating on a chair after reading the Divine Comedy for the 20th time at the very end where he has he ascends to paradise. And I'm, I'm sitting in this chair and suddenly I had one of these object ground reversal experiences. Everything around me in the room became background and the space between the things became the, the foreground. And I just went, <gasps> like I wrote about it in the book and my editor was like, <laughs> I couldn't express it. it. It didn't look like anything once I wrote it down. But what I saw was this incredibly vibrant emptiness that is absolutely brimming with, with knowledge, with love, with, with creativity, with intensity. And it's not stuff. It's the stuff between stuff. And it's just because I'd been sitting on a chair looking into this space for 20 minutes that I, I literally felt like I fell into it. I, I, I felt like I'd fallen off the chair because I couldn't see the chair anymore. I saw the space where the chair was not. <laughs> I saw the space inside the chair and I just thought I was gonna fall. But then I realized I didn't have any 
corporeal matter either. Everything was completely empty and absolutely solid at the same time. I can't explain it. I just know it's there and we have the capability to, to experience it. Sarah says, can you talk about bringing not being into being? I seem to go in one or the other, but have trouble bringing non-being into being. Yeah, you can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do anything with this stuff. It is. All you can do is notice it or not notice it. And it's always there. That's the thing is I don't sit around going, oh, I wish I could get that feeling back. Because one of the things that I'm absolutely empirically dead sure of is that it's always there. It's always everywhere. It's like when my son Adam talked about the light that visited him in his room when he was sad as a teenager. He says it's everywhere. It comes from everything. It is filling everything. And all you have to do is go a little bit blank, go into the space where you don't really feel like you are anybody, and boom, you may perceive it, but then you'll come out of it and not be able to remember what it was because now you're thinking with being. It's, it's this weird and wonderful and delicious paradox. Um, Marge says, does your research explore temporal constraints, anxiety perceived as excitement in those moments? Uh, GBBO, Great British um, Baking Show contestants have said, have said changes when the time constraint kicks in. Yeah, if you have pressure or anxiety, if you're like, meditate faster or, attain, you know, attain enlightenment. No, nah, it won't happen at all. Your attention then is going to try to strive with being. And, and that anything that is afraid can't see the door. It doesn't look like anything to fear. And we run mostly on fear. We're mostly paying attention to what fear makes us pay attention to. When we're paying attention to non-fear, which is just being, it's not even an emotional state, we start to see the hidden doors everywhere. And they can open literally inside your own head, um, when you're lying in bed, if you read the stories from Asia of the moments people got enlightened, it's really interesting that it just can happen any time. But the moment a time constraint kicks in, typically we lose it. Last of all, constellations in her bones. Love that. Do you sense we are shifting from a language slash mind existence to a being slash feeling existence? Will more folks discover enlightenment and expansive love? I do. I, I used to prevaricate about this because like, I was trying to be um, rational. But I actually believe that we are shifting that way and that every time it happens to a different person, because we're all one consciousness, it's as if a part of each of us wakes up. So I was saying to my students in Wild New World, the class, on, the online class, um, if somebody in Bangladesh, or maybe am I saying it to you, if somebody in Bangladesh or Singapore or Saudi Arabia suddenly attains enlightenment, part of you does too, because you are not disconnected from that person. Nothing is disconnected from anything in the space of non-being. It's this little door. We walk past it every day. We think past it every day, but every single day in the space between your thoughts that you, don't, you probably don't notice, your enlightenment steps up and it shines. And you go to the places where it where you feel it because you feel it as a sort of sweetness and you can't explain it you can only start to go where it it feels like it is and then relax because it's in the spaces of not looking not trying that the door pops into focus and we can open it and look through it and go oh my god 95 percent of my existence was completely unknown to me and it's always been awake. It's always been in love. It's always been joyful. It just is the bliss of being. So I hope you find lots of little hidden doors in your dreams. And I think I hope you find lots of little hidden doors as you go through your life. Just remember, it's a subject ground reversal. Bing, 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 bing. And if you keep looking at the moments where you're not looking at anything, one day you're going to realize it. <gasps> and then you'll have that to, as a little map to find the next door and to open that first door again and again and again. I think you're wonderful. You're all enlightened, whether you know it or not. And I can't wait to see you again right here on The Gathering Room. Bye. Not very good at ending.